Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CFES Brilliant Pathways new series, Insights from Entrepreneurs. Uh, very excited to kick off episode one uh, with an individual that has uh, worked in a number of our schools, Mariah, Malone, Fort Di, I think, um, and some others, um, and really defines the um, the pathway that um, I, we've had a lot of questions about already in terms of how to become an entrepreneur. We have a lot of students who are uh, very curious about how one would do that. Um, I'll introduce him in a, in a second. And I, I do want to mention CFES. Um, we're doing some research and have some projects with the University of Vermont um, that our CEO, Rick Dalton, is um, putting together, one of which is um, high school students for across the country, uh, CFES students and others can um, submit an entrepreneurial idea uh, to the UVM Entrepreneurship Club, and they will, um, they'll pick some, uh, some winners from that and there's some scholarship money available. And, you know, a lot of that stems from some of Rick's research and um, young um, students today thinking about wanting to be their own boss and how to become an entrepreneur. And so I will segue into the introduction of Brogan Morgan, who will talk about uh, how he Eventually, I'll read a brief description after working as a senior product manager at NRG Systems in Hinesburg, where he, where he is now, um, where he developed a bat deterrent system using ultrasound to reduce bat mortality near wind turbines. Um, so he struck out on his own in January of 2020. Um, he's a mechanical engineer, and it's wildlife imaging systems that he uh, started on his own. But I'm going to let him uh, take us through what, you know, he's going to show a little bit about what that entails what his job is like, what he works on, and then kind of segue into uh, him talking about um, how he sort of became an entrepreneur and take some questions from our students that I'm, I'm seeing that you can put in the chat box and I have some as well. So without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Brogan. Thanks, Thanks John. I'm gonna uh, share my screen here. Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. All right then. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me on today. Um, as John said, I'm Brogan Morton, uh, and I founded Wildlife Imaging Systems uh, about three years ago. So maybe a little bit about me. Um, I, my, I live in Vermont, in Hinesburg. Um, my job right now is, uh, if I want to sound really fancy, I'm, I'm the CEO of Wildlife Imaging Systems, but probably more importantly, I'm the founder. Um, education, I was a mechanical engineer by training, um, and I... I have quite a few passions that I'm lucky enough to have converged into what is my job today. So as, as John mentioned, I started working at a company, uh, NRG Systems here in Hinesburg, and they supply um, metallurgical equipment to the wind energy industry. And so uh, when I got out of, I ended up getting my MBA. When I got out of that, I came, wanted to move back to New England. I was in Idaho at the time, and I was looking for something in renewable energy and was lucky enough to get into energy systems where I get to learn a heck of a lot about wind energy. Um, but in addition to that, I love the outdoors. Uh, I love wildlife conservation and conservation in general. And um, I'm, I'm a huge you know, fan of STEM. Um, I love to talk about it. I love to try to help get kids into it because um, I think it's a really great way to kind of fuel your passions and to make some of the things that you want to, some of the changes you might want to see in the world that are an actual reality. So now we can talk a little bit about um, Wildlife Imaging Systems, which is the company I founded three years ago. So kind of the, how we describe ourselves is we uh, focused on bringing computer vision and machine learning technologies to wildlife conservation. So that sounds maybe a little too, little too <laughs> fancy here, right? Computer vision is really taking video and trying to do some sort of uh, apply software to it, which can help us make better decisions, right? So you've probably seen some uh, things where you can do different you know, uh, highlighting objects or all kinds of different things. If you're ever on your Snapchat, the way it applies faces and morphs things, like that's all kind of a combination of computer vision and image processing. And then what we do is we take similar algorithms to probably what you've seen and all that sort of stuff, and we apply it to wildlife conservation. Um, we have been, uh, from the beginning, a bootstrap company. We have not taken in outside investment from anybody, um, but we have been lucky enough to win uh, several small business innovative research grants from um, National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. So these are programs that are focused on providing small businesses, as is in the title, uh, who are doing kind of high tech work um, grants to try to develop a commercial product. So I'm going to talk about kind of one of those today. 
but first, uh, as John mentioned, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit about bats because I, I do love STEM and I do want to talk a little bit about biology and because I think bats are, are pretty cool. So I don't know if everybody's seen a bat. There's a lot of people who might be afraid of bats, right? And aren't sure what the heck is going on, but I think they tend to be pretty cute. Up close, they look pretty fuzzy. They got the cute little ears, um, you know, but interesting. They are the only uh, mammal who is capable of true flight. So it makes them really, really, really unique. Um, one of the things you could see is obviously what's very unique about them is their wings, right? And I do want to um, kind of show a little bit and there won't be a quiz after. So no one has to write down what all these things are. But the interesting thing about a bat is that its entire wing is actually just really a, kind of a morphed hand, right? So Chiroptera, which is the, 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 the Latin name for it, actually means wing hand. So you can see that uh, that is its elbow right there, its forearm, and each one of these is actually a finger. Uh, so imagine if your fingers grew to, you know, 10 times as long as they were now and then skin between them, like that's what a bat um, actually has. And bats have those enormously large ears. Many of them do, right? And that's because bats are super unique in that they echolocate. So they emit um, sound, it goes out, it bounces off things, and that's how they're actually able to um, kind of move around an environment in the dark. They can still see, and they do have vision, and their vision is actually pretty good, but operating in complete darkness, which is kind of their ecological niche, uh, it's kind of, it relies on that, on the echolocation. So, um, I have been lucky enough to be able to actually go out into the field and uh, work with bat biologists. And I never had a sense of how big a bat was, but that's a picture of a bat in that technician's hand. So when you think about a bat, it, you might think that they're big, but actually they fit pretty readily into the palm of your hand. Now, when they spread out their wings, it can be, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a, a foot wide or something like that. But when they're kind of just balled up, um, you know, they're, they're actually quite small. Uh, what do they eat? It all depends. They eat all kinds of different things, but the ones that we have in like the new England region typically are eating insects. And that's really important, especially in like places like the Midwest, because bats are, can be a very important, uh, source of, you know, instead of using an insecticide bats come and they eat a lot of crop pests. So, uh, this is one, one of my favorite little stats. So there's a cave in Texas and it's the largest known, um, aggregation of bats in the world. 20 million Mexican free tail bats live in Brac Bracken cave. And every night they go out and they can eat 200 tons of insects in one night. So that's like eating 200 Volkswagen beetle cars worth of insects in every night. So people who benefit from that are, you know, farmers or well, all of us, if they're eating, you know, pests, you know, mosquitoes, things like that, but also farmers huge benefit to bats. And they're really, really super important, um, as, you know, uh, animals to, to conserve in the environment. But a lot of you might be saying, what do bats have to do with anything? And, and this is, we'll, we'll make this an extent more than just a biology lesson. I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, because unfortunately there are many bat species who are threatened and those um, bat species uh, kind of th face three main threats right now. One is habitat loss which is simply you know, less, less habitat for them to forage and do all the things. Second is white nose syndrome. I'm not gonna go too far into depth, but that was something that was actually introduced um, from a caves, from for, into caves and, and affects cave dwelling bats. And, um, and, but then the final one is wind farms. So it's kind of an issue because I think I showed you in the beginning that I have a huge passion for wind energy, right? I think it's super important to get more renewables on the landscape, but they do have an impact on these bats and these threatened bat species. So it was one of those places when I started working at NRG that we saw that there was a problem that needed a solution. If we wanted to enable more wind to get be able to be put on the landscape, then we needed to um, be able to reconcile or to fix this problem. Uh, I actually picked this uh, photo in particular right here. This is one of those uh, uh, free tail bat that you can see. Bats can't actually start flying if they're on the ground. They actually need to climb up on something and drop two to three feet to actually um, take off in flight, which is actually what you're seeing here. The bats let go and it's just starting to, to glide out. So what happens at wind farms? Well, unfortunately, uh, bats, like I said, are the only mammals that fly. So they fly around at night. They are looking for, again, many of these wind turbines are in agricultural areas. So they might be flying around looking for crop pests. No one's exactly sure what's happening, but the wind turbine blades are, you know, when they're operating are spinning. 
right? That's how they generate electricity is they take energy and they spin and they turn the, the generator in the wind turbine itself. Well, those blades are going really fast. The tips of those blades can be going a quarter of the speed of sound. And so we're talking about a bat in the dark who's trying to echolocate to find things. If something's coming at a quarter of the speed of the sound, it's just too fast for it to kind of perceive it as a risk and then avoid it. So some bats do unfortunately get struck by the blades. So wind farms can actually cause a direct mortality of these bats. Um, at my previous job, we were working on the ultrasonic acoustic deterrence. Now I do have a video here and hopefully it comes through uh, okay on, uh, on Zoom, but you probably see a lot of little dots flying around. All those little dots are bats around a wind turbine. And one of the things you'll notice is they're not just flying through and going somewhere else. For some reason, they seem to be interested in staying in the airspace that's around this turbine. Now, luckily for these bats, those blades, the wind must be really low, the blades aren't spinning, and so that doesn't pose a risk to bats. So when I was working at NRG uh, and we were trying to solve this problem, uh, I kind of had that, that eureka moment, right? So we said, why is this happening? And I said, hey, why don't we use cameras to monitor bats around wind turbines to figure this out? And there's a special kind of camera that we use. That video that you just saw was actually called a thermal camera. So instead, imagine uh, using a, a normal camera you know, on your phone or on any other device you see. Um, you'd have to put a heck of a lot of light out there and you still probably couldn't see very far, uh, even if you did that. Thermal cameras don't use light. They actually sense the warmth of the body. And so, when you angle the camera up at the wind turbine, you could notice that the turbine was kind of white and, and, and it was a white hot, um, right? And then the bats, the sky is actually very cold. Space is very cold. So the bats, there's a really great contrast between the bats and that background. You can actually see them. Now, I do wanna say that um, I was not the first person to have this idea. I had seen videos like this and said, why aren't we doing more of this? Really, that was what we said. There were some researchers doing some really cool research. But a lot of times researchers are just doing things at a very small scale. So this is one of the things that I talk about uh, when, I, when I talk to folks who are kind of interested in, in entrepreneurship, which is you don't have to be the first person to have ever thought about it, right? There's probably a lot of people who have thought about a lot of things. And so what we did is we just said, the important thing isn't that we didn't have the original idea. It's that we're going to focus on scaling it. We need to do this at more than one or two wind turbines. We need to make this an economic choice for wind developers to do this sort of uh, thing uh, and what's the benefit to them around hundreds of turbines at a time, not just a couple on a research plot. And so I do, I don't love using create, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship's quotes, but this one, I actually really resonated with me. And because there's a lot of people who think about, you know, whether it's creativity or innovation or all these things um, as like some magic art that you have to just have a natural gift for. And so, you know, Steve Jobs, Creativity is just connecting these different ideas. So when you when you when you think about how how did you come up with that idea, it wasn't necessarily that I was the first one to have this idea. I just saw oh I know something about thermal cameras oh and I know something about what bats are doing at wind turbines and I and I had all these things and I I do I did I felt a little guilty. I was just like well I don't I didn't come up with anything really new. I just put a few things that were already out there together in a way that no one had before. So it didn't feel like this amazing epiphany. I didn't wake up in the middle of the night and and you know went to the to a the angel choir singing you know <laughs> anything like that. It was simply kind of a the hard work of understanding what was going on and, and connecting some some of the dots on things. Honestly, so I'll talk a little bit about what you know as a company that we we actually do and and what our solution was. So what we decided to do is use those thermal cameras. And what we do is we said, hey. Um, we don't need to manufacture thermal cameras. That's really expensive. There's a lot of people who do that really, really well. So what we're going to do is we're going to buy these cameras. And that's what you see over here on the left-hand side. It, what's in that fenced off area on those tripods, that's a thermal camera. And we're going to make it work off of a solar panel and a battery because you're in the middle of nowhere and you can't necessarily get power from the turbine. So again, there's all just these tiny little problems that we solve. Oh yeah, and we're going to save all the video to an SD card. And then we're going to have someone go pull that and upload it. And then we're going to process that video. So what these cameras are doing is they're looking up at that wind turbine, right? Just like in that video that you saw. And so all these things are things that we don't even really, you know, we um, put them all together, but we didn't design any of them, right? What we did is we said, I, we're gonna come up with a software solution because these cameras are recording video 15 to 16 hours a night. And so if you have a project where you're doing that for three to six months out of the year, 
uh, across 50 turbines, <laughs> it's too much video for anybody to watch. And so to get any other information out of that, you have to have software that can actually take that video and make it useful. And that was really our solution is to create a software solution. And so what we could do is we have software. This is just a, one of the outputs of our software, which is kind of the fun one, I'll call it the qualitative one, where, you know, over 10 minutes of video, this represents 10 minutes of video. So everything that happened kind of on average and aggregate is kind of grayscale. So you can see the wind turbine, the blades are moving. So that it's kind of blurred out. Everything that was a detection and interesting is turned yellow, right? This sort of, and we do all this in our software. Right, And this sort of thing makes that full 10 minutes of video kind of human digestible in a very brief amount of time. So this is kind of the, you know, the interesting field work. This is most of my day, honestly, which is, this is Python. And this is some of the code that we actually write. And so again, what I love about Python and a lot of these things is I can guarantee every one of you can go home tonight if you wanted to and download a free Python package off the internet onto your computer and start writing code just like this. Um, it's completely open source, it's free, and you can start doing these things. I did all these things when I started my business by using free uh, software packages um, that are available open source. You don't have to read through it. It's very boring. There's lots of lines of code. But the point is, is you know, if you're interested in coding, um, get out there and just start using those free tools and just playing around with it. Because I guarantee that you're going to come up with something someday where it'll in that, that passion for doing that will intersect with some problem that you see. And so this is really, in essence, our software. This is a little bit of a different camera angle. We didn't get to tell the operators where to put this one. But so the whole point of our software is you're going to see there's a little bat up there. And what we're just doing is our software is putting the little dots behind it. So what we can do here is well, we know temporally and spatially how these bats are actually interacting with the wind turbines itself. So it's really that quantitative data uh, right, that we save off um, in the background. Uh, the cool images are cool, but this is the real data that we end up getting. We can count the number of bats around the wind turbine at any one time and do all kinds of interesting metrics. So how can we use these things to help? Well, one of the things that we're working to do is if we understand when the bats are there, we can stop the turbine when the bats are around and only when the bats are around. Or we can use that data and see how it's correlated with other uh, conditions, wind conditions on the wind farm um, that you can use to maybe model it and figure out how to do a better job. Also, we have a couple of projects that have been funded where we're trying to understand the behavior. Now, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, so I work with biologists. I collaborate with biologists, and that's a very important thing, right, which I'll talk about is that collaboration, teamwork, and networking, right? I'm not a biologist. I have to work with other people who bring that knowledge to bear, but I have to make that information available to them in, an, in something they can digest. And that's what some of these images do is they help them interpret what they think these bats might actually be doing around these wind turbines. Um, where else can we use this technology? So this is actually taken in Vermont. Um, this is a bat house and it can be used to set up, you know, it can be important, very important, especially with the uh, endangered species that we have, just to be able to monitor their populations. And so we actually use our software, set up a camera, record for a couple hours and set up software so we can actually automate the counting because um, I've actually volunteered to do this and trying to count bats when it's getting dark is incredibly difficult. And these thermal cameras do an amazing job of really popping them out from the background. Um, so I kind of want to close in with, with kind of three things uh, that I want to talk uh, and talk about my personal uh, experiences with these lessons learned and kind of starting my own company. Um, the first is kind of tied with the essential skill of networking. Um, it's really important to know. And if you're, if you're thinking about starting your own thing, you may be nervous because you say, well, I'm not really sure if this is a good idea or not. Guess what? There is no entrepreneur who started off knowing for sure it was a really great identity. Really, all you can really start with is a real is an intuition or a really good guess. But you can't go blindly going down there. You really need to validate it with all the stakeholders. If you're trying to solve a problem, understanding everybody, all the stakeholders' perspectives, that's important. So you can guess what the solution might be, but you really have to go get the input from all those stakeholders. That means getting out there and talking to the people who are affected by the problem and who would have to implement the solution. And the way you can do that is through networking, right? having a wide array of people who you can draw on at any given moment, call up on the phone or in a web meeting and say, hey, I had this idea, what do you think? Um, and they can either tell you it's a great idea or you're going in the right direction or it's a terrible idea, right? And you're going the wrong direction. Because really in the end, you kind of need three things. Uh, and this is kind of a classic uh, lean startup sort of uh, methodology. Really what you're trying to do is be in the middle of these things. So 
desirable. It means you've created something that people actually want. It's a really good solution, right, to the problem. Feasible, it means that you can actually make it, right? It's not just a pie in the sky dream. You've reduced it to practice, right? And then finally, viable. Viable is an interesting one. Viable means that you can create a business model around it, right? Someone's willing to pay you for it. You can come up with some really cool things that are desirable and that you can build that no one's willing to willing to pay pay for pay for, right? And if they're not willing to pay for it, you can't build a business around it. So when you're thinking about ideas and thinking about things, you have to keep kind of these three things and you're aiming for the middle. That's the only way to really find that long-term success is to aim for the middle of kind of these basic three. The second one um, is agility. This has to do with the first thing you'll you'll find out when you strike out on your, on your own is nothing stays the same and you're going to learn a lot really fast and you need to be flexible and you need to be prepared to pivot based on new information. Um, this is the first iteration of the system that I was telling you about. It is a totally different technology. It, it's using uh, near infrared light in a totally different type of camera. And we started, this is what we started with. And we did experiment after experiment after experiment, and it didn't work the way that we wanted it to. And so what did we have to do? We had to pivot. It was a good idea but we had to change the technology we were using. And we kind of had to rewind rewind back to not the beginning, but, and we still, we learned a lot, um, but being comfortable knowing that you're going to have to make changes as you go. And that's just part of the process. And it doesn't mean that you aren't doing it right. It actually means you're doing it right when you're having to make those adjustments. No one comes out of, you know, goes into the thing with a fully formed idea that stays intact through the whole, the whole cycle of business. And then finally is perseverance. And this is one of the most important. And I would say this is this is you know this is one of my mantras, which is only a mistake if you don't learn from it. You will make mistakes, you will screw up, and as long as you learn from it, as long as you look at what happened, you say, "Here's how I won't repeat that," and here's how I'm going to do better next time. That's the only thing you can ask of yourself. And uh, so, of course, I have to. This is uh, the first proposal I uh, submitted, and this is my. Uh, declination of proposal. This is the first proposal and it was declined. Uh, I did not win my first proposal on my first attempt. In fact, it was administratively declined if you if you read closely, which means I made a mistake in my application. And so it wasn't even considered on its technical merits. It was declined uh, before that. And that this was, as you might imagine, incredibly discouraging, right? It takes an incredible amount of time to put together a proposal like one of these things. And what you have to do is know that what did I do wrong? You don't, you know, you can feel sad for a minute, but then you got to get over it pretty quick and say, how am I going to not make this happen again? And, and whether it's getting declined administratively or because you're, someone didn't understand your idea, working with, you know, whatever, however you need to get your idea across, um, you know, perseverance, it's super, super important. And, and I would say probably the, the most important, which is kind of, I saved the best for last on this one. And with that, I will uh, open it up to, to questions. Yeah, thanks, bro. That's great. You know, I, the networking, agility, and perseverance, you know, three essential skills that we talk about a lot. It's mm -hmm. one thing to sort of talk about it, but you just gave some great examples of how, how it's applied. I yep. think the perseverance piece is, is great because you're going to get, you know, throughout life, you're going to get, there's going to be rejection. There's, you know, yes. you, you just got to get this, this thick skin and just, you know, exactly like you said, it's not, you got to learn, you know, it's not a mistake. If you, you've got to, if you learn anything from it, um, that's a, a powerful way to move forward um, and really yeah. like the idea of sort of d deciding if the kind of the need is there, um, is it viable to produce it? And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, is it, yep. is it, you know, something that people are, can you produce it and is there a market for it? Absolutely. Um, but one of the questions yeah. about kind of framing all that, I, I, I get it. I've gotten it from a number of students where they'll say, is it better to, um, you have this idea you're passionate and you kind of jump into it as opposed to say like yourself, you work in a, at a company for someone else in a field that you're interested in, you gain this knowledge and then you kind of branch out on your own. What, mm -hmm. what, what are your kind of, what's your advice sort of on that, those two different paths? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great question. Both are viable, but, but I would say both are viable uh, in, in very different ways. Uh, excuse me. There's an example of a company here uh, in Vermont who it was a, a person who got their PhD and then from their PhD program decided to start a company based on the technology they developed in their PhD. Um, I don't have a PhD. 
And, and so you can take the angle where you say, I know this technology that no one else knows. I know it deeper than anybody else. And I know it has applications and I'm going to try to kind of out technology somebody. Right. And so what you end up having to do is you have a technology and try to, and then you try to fit it. Right. You're, you're starting with the, you know, it's feasible. So then you're looking for, is it desirable to anybody? Does anybody really care? And is it viable? Right. And I took a little bit of a different approach and I said, I don't, I'm going to look for, uh, I took a course where I worked for quite some time in the industry. I was noticing, it became a, a reflex of mine to kind of notice problems. Um, and I, you know, so I noticed this problem. And so from the beginning, I felt pretty comfortable um, knowing that I was addressing a problem that people actually had. Uh, that's when it is an incredible problem and, and, it, and it makes companies lose money. And I knew that. So then to me, I went the other way and I said, well, I know there's a market problem. Can I find a technology that can solve that problem in a way that actually helps everybody, right? So I, again, is it viable? I know we could do it, but can I make a business out of this thing, um, knowing that there's a market there for it? And they have, and uh, maybe one other thing, um, they're, they're kind of two different paths. I took a, there's maybe two th ways to think about it. Um, some folks, uh, you know, go get venture capital money or some sort of initial investment from angel investors or something. And, you know, kind of plow through. And so in essence, what they're doing is they're starting with a chunk of money and not necessarily making revenue, but they're just trying to develop this thing that they hope once they, you know, before they get to the bottom of that or get another round of money, they can, they can get to some more of the revenue positive. I did a little different and I, I did something which you would call uh, bootstrapping, which is I started with my own, I saved money. I started with my own money. It was terrifying to quit my job, which you know was a was a was a fixed salary, and I knew it was going to be there, and I wasn't going to get fired. Um, and it was terrifying, but save that money and then try to start getting um, you know jobs where you're consulting, you're helping people solve actual problems very quickly, and they're paying you to do it. It's a great way to test out your ideas, right? If you're an expert in this thing, then someone's probably somewhere going to pay you to help solve that problem on a project by project basis. And then you can say, oh, can I scale this? Can I make it bigger? Um, and that's kind of how we started is we said, I'm, I'm almost going to act like a consultant at first and do project-based work. Uh, make sure that I can, there's A, there's a market and B, that uh, I can sustain myself um, and not try to go get a million or $2 million worth of venture money, which again, puts different... Uh, pressures and all kinds of things on you. So, yeah, that's really interesting. The funding piece like that, you know, we, um, we had a couple of students say, well, what if I just continued a job that I was in and sort of started um, maybe like you said, doing a little bit of consulting mm -hmm. in the area where I want to go. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of is maybe, maybe a little less scary because you're not totally jumping off the yeah. cliff of not having a job. Is that something that is is doable or is it, you know, I, I another student said I, I'd love to get a bunch of seed money and and just do it, but then there's probably pressures that come with you know, here's yeah. a million dollars you better produce. Yeah, is that it, it sounds like those are two different emotions that you would have if you were <laughs> absolutely absolutely. Um, I guess I would I'd say it in two different ways. Um, which is I love people who have a, a side, we we'll call it a side hustle. Right. It's like, yeah, it's a thing that you're and it's not it's not necessarily that you're trying to just make money. You're trying to test out to see if your idea has any legs. And if you're treating it like that, it's a great idea. As long as it doesn't conflict with your company, if you're competing with your own company or whoever, you know, like that, they're obviously, you know, consult your lawyer or whatever. But um, I think a side hustle is great. And um, it's allowing you to make again, I, we get back to early experiments. And one of them is if you can go find people who will pay you to do the thing that you wanted to do or your business, and you start getting three or four of those clients on the side, and then you say, man, I can't do all this work on the side and keep a day job. But if I jump right now, I bet I can go find three or four more people to pay me to do this. You know what I mean? It makes it a lot less scary. I mean, leaving, leaving without any, you know, the paying clients or anything like that, it's, it can be scary. I mean, the, the, so the hard part about, um, you got to remember a couple of things, which is if you're going for funding, no matter what, whether it's venture or like angel investors, anything like that, um, they're expecting a significant return on their money and which is totally legitimate, right? They're taking a pretty big risk. Um, and so they want, you know, a pretty significant multiple of what they're going to put in. Um, but that also means that they need that the idea that you have has to be a big idea. And the bigger the idea, the more money that you'll get. And that also means the more competition you're going to get. Um, because again, you're not the only one who's had this idea. I wasn't the only one who had my idea, right? Um, but I'm in a small enough market where my 
entrance into it didn't precipitate anybody getting, you know, $5 million of seed money to, to go do something. So again, it, it, it all depends what you want to do. If you want to make a, you know, a billion dollar company, then you're going to need to take that. You're going to need to take that venture route. I'm looking for something where I can kind of uh, combine my passions and, 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 and do something I really like to do. And that aligns with what I want to do. Uh, so, so wind energy and wildlife conservation, I, I'm going to tell you, I will never sell this company for a billion dollars, <laughs> but that's not my goal. My goal is to, again, work for myself and do something that I want to do. And so if that's your goal, um, you may not need someone to, you know, give you a million dollars because guess what? With that million dollars also means that they get a say in what you're doing. And so it all, you got to really think about what your goals are when you're, when you do it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, a student mentioned Shark Tank and yeah. sort of the idea that, you know, you go on Shark Tank and they're like, yeah. I'll get, you know, I, I get 30% of your company, but, you know, and then they, you get $200,000 or whatever. It's just yeah. such a, it, it's kind of like what you're talking about in a more it sort is. of distinct way. It is. A big question, right? I'm going to give you 30% for. Yes. And, and, and that they, they take part of the company, which they are going to own. And that also gives them a, a again, like a, uh, a, a voice in the t a, a, the decision about what the, where the company is going to go and what it's going to do. Um, you may get to a point, you may say, oh, I want to go this way. And they may say, mm, no, we're going to go this way because this is where we think the money is. And you've given up part of right your autonomy for, and again, like it's doesn't, it doesn't make it bad. It simply means you got to know what you're getting into right in the beginning there. Um, you have other voices at the table. Yeah. Which is because I mean, half the reason or part of the reason you're going into it is so you do have autonomy and it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, and you're sort yeah. of like getting it back, you know? Yeah, it's um, true. It's true. The question in the chat box here says, what's one skill you feel like you wished you had developed prior to starting your own company? <laughs> Just one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. No. Uh, uh, I had no idea uh, about, it. Uh, again, a very specific one about accounting and, and, and financing cash flows and things like that. Um, that's, that's pretty critical. Um, and you can get a lot of that information anywhere. Accounting sounds, you know, not maybe the most interesting, but it is super important. You know, understanding, you know, basic things, net 30 terms. So when I do a job, I invoice somebody and they don't pay me for 30 days until after I invoice them. So that means I can do some work at the end of the month, I send them an invoice and 30 days later, they might pay me. That's almost, it could be up to two months between when I actually did the job and I get paid. Accounting that says, okay, you need to worry about cash flows. You need to have enough buffer. You need to, you know what I mean? And that sort of thing, I didn't, you know, um, I hadn't, I hadn't done kind of the, the blocking and tackling of that before. And I did uh, work with, um, I do work with outside accountants, which is super helpful, but just still got to know, right. What's actually happening um, because it's your business. you need to know, like, you know, the money is the lifeblood, right? It's not the reason you do it, but you don't do it without it. Um, and so understanding how that all works and profit and loss and how do you, how do you price things? You know what I mean? Like, uh, you don't want to go, if you're doing something uh, per hour, that's great. But, um, if you're a consultant and you can only fill up 50% of your time, you know what I mean? With, with paying gigs. So how much do you actually need? Um, so thinking about that financial side for me, I mean, I was an engineer, so I was comfortable with the engineering side and I was comfortable with customers and things like that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a competition question here. So in terms yeah. of when you get into the field, the student's curious about how do you know what's already out there? I mean, you can sort of look around, but yeah. when, like earlier when you addressed the need question, yes. um, I'm sure you could look online, you'd be like, oh, this, but to really know if there's enough space for you to, yeah. to work there and make money, how do, how do you sort of like check the competition? That's tough. Um, so the first thing is, uh, you know, internet searching is, is interesting um, and it's a good start and you should do it. It's like the, it's like the minimum, you know, entry into the thing. Um, if there are prospective customers that you can talk to, um, that's really a great way to understand like who's already doing something like this. Is there really nobody doing this? How are you doing it now? What you will oftentimes find is you're not even competing against a customer who does exactly what you do. Um, you might be competing against the status quo, which is, you know, like, well, we, we've always done it this way and, and you're not, your solution isn't quite compelling enough to move us, take the risk to, to actually do it. So I, I honestly think in a lot of ways, you might find that you go do something and you don't have a ton of direct competition, 
but getting someone to change their habits and patterns and things like that can actually sometimes be the the biggest. Um, so yeah, I, talking to people again, networking and getting out and talking to people. You don't don't try to do it on the internet. Talk to people because they'll tell you, and and you ask them at the end of every conversation. So uh, I was lucky enough that I took a uh, when I was at NRG. I took a course called Voice of the Customer, and it was a way to do customer interviews to try to understand their their needs. And um, but practice those sorts of you know like talking to somebody about what they actually need. And then at the end of it, people love to be listened to. People love to be actually no, people love to be heard. If they've got a problem, they want to be heard. And if you are saying I can potentially solve this problem, they love to be heard. And at the end of it, I, every time I'd like what did what you know what didn't I ask you that I should have. Because again, you don't know enough. And sometimes that's the beginning of the conversation, <laughs> even though it should, you were kind of intending it to be the end. Um, so getting those listening skills up and getting and talking to people is how you're going to figure out w- where you should go next. Yeah. So what's, whether that's competition or just your idea is okay, but not great or anything like that, talk, get out there and talk to people. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, we have one other question here that's kind of, it's sort of... Um, the word accounting, marketing, sales, yeah. how do you learn to do all, you have to do, you kind of have to be, uh, do everything. If, yes. you're, if Now, like you said, you could get an outside, mm-hmm. account, whatever, but uh, how do you, how do you, do you feel confident enough to be able to do all those things like <laughs> sales and whatnot? And then, mm-hmm. and, and is there any major, looks like they're sort of curious about, is there a particular major you might maybe it's entrepreneurship and business, you know, that would be the yeah. easy answer, but, um, areas that, you know, I guess it depends on the, the industry for one, if you feel comfortable on the actual production and technology, um, mm-hmm. that's one area, but then how do you sort of be a mess yeah. all these trades? In, in one? It's a great question. Um, I'm a, yeah, I'm, I'm a kind of a jack of all trades, master of none is what it comes down to. And that's what I like. But also I would say you don't have to do this alone. There's plenty of people who co-found companies. And I would say if you're going to co-found companies, uh, don't pick someone who has exactly your skill set. You know, if you're the if you're if you're the person who loves to do the technical tinkering, you know, find someone who's going to do the sales and marketing, right? And that that makes your team better than the some the individual parts, right? If you're both great at the technical stuff and neither one of you wants to do the sales and marketing, that's going to be a struggle. Um, so finding places and then you'll, and then there's conflict about, well, who's going to do this, that, you know, if you kind of find people who have um, overlap, but kind of ex- mutually exclusive skill sets to you. And then I would also say like, again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, get out there and talk to people. Like I have, I know people who are in sales. And if I have a question, I say, what would you do in this situation? You know what I mean? Um, you, you're not meant to have all the answers to start you need to build a network so you have the resources that you can reach out to people. Um, there's small business development centers, you know, all around v- Vermont to reach out to people, or excuse me, Vermont and New York, everywhere, really. Um, talk to them and they're going to point you to the right people. I need an accountant. I need someone who has sales and marketing experience. And a lot of times they'll offer classes. They'll do all kinds of things. Um, so what, what I have found is um, Probably the most, one of the, another kind of important skill is to know what what the most important thing that you need to do. You can't do it all right, right at the beginning. Right. And so what is the most important one? And that, that answer changes for whatever the different opportunity is being able to identify, which is that most important one. And, and I would say, if you're thinking about it now, think about the things that you love to do. And then think about the things that you dread to do and um, find someone for the things you dread to do and, and start learning those and, you know, let your passion, but always move forward with the thing that you're most passionate about because so I'll, sorry, I'm getting a little long winded here, but people, when you're talking to potential customers or stakeholders or whatever, if they see you're passionate about something, they are like, Oh, this person, they get it. You know what I mean? And they want to solve the problem. And that really counts for a lot. So, you know, when you're going to do something, make sure it's not just the dollars and cents that I think you're choosing to do it. And it doesn't mean it has to be like your, your, your life's ultimate goal, but make sure that you can be passionate about it and, or develop a passion for it. Yeah, that's great. But especially the piece about finding a partner that brings other skills to the table. And yeah. then just whenever I, anybody, you know, if you have to hire somebody to do something around your house, whatever it is, you yeah. see the passion from them and you're like, 
they're going to probably do totally. this they're so into it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I would also say, uh, I worked, I took maybe a, maybe what, what people might consider a non-traditional route. I started, uh, my company when I was 40, 40, 42, 41. Right. Um, I, the jobs I had had previously gave me a, another breadth of experience, right? I had been an engineer. I had been in sales and marketing. I had done, so you don't have to do it now, right? Like it doesn't have to be right out of school or whatever to do the thing. Um, it doesn't always have to follow that path. So if you do decide to get into an industry and take on a job, if you really are interested in going on your own, try to talk to all those people in that organization and, and maybe try to move around within an organization to try to do all the different things um, and get a taste for what they actually are. Honestly, yeah, if I if I had started right out of school, um, it would have been a lot more of a struggle um, because in a lot of the positions I had in some of my companies, like I worked my way up. So I did have to put together budgets, right? And I did have to think about these things anyway. And so I was expected to do that in my day job. And so kind of transitioning that over to, you know, this this new venture made it a lot easier. Yeah, that 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 and that also kind of answers the, is there any knowledge you um know now that you wish you had previous kind of the same as a, as the first question a little bit that would have helped you. I mean, you you just addressed it in the, in the sense that you can learn these things in different careers leading up to it. Yeah. So but when you do launch and you were like, you know, 40 at the time 41, uh you kind of have this bevy of skills that uh yeah. you, know, you acquired because it would be I think of my you know anybody at 22 23 you know, you don't have a ton of skills acquired yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, not that you couldn't launch, but I mean, still, you rely on others and network, like you're saying. But yeah. it sounds like a nice combo where you have experience and you kind of have learned how to network by that time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I, I was not a networker when I got out of school. No one had told me how important it was. And the first job I had, someone told me how important it was. And I was a young engineer. I'm just like, oh, it can't be that important. And then through my career, I was like, it's it's not everything, but it, it is super important. Super important. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that, this seems like a good place to leave. Is there, if there's any, unless anything else you want to add, I think we have students that will reach out and probably have some questions for you that they could send to you. And yeah, absolutely. You did a great, you know, great job just sort of laying it out there and how how you got to where you where you are today and. Uh, just the 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 skill sets uh, and essential skills that that CFES that we kind of talk about. We do have a yeah. lot of employers say we can teach you the job, but it's these yeah. other essential skills that we need <laughs> totally. to, to learn. Yeah. Um, and we'd love to have love to get you back in some schools too. I know we were talking earlier; it was sort of like the beginning of COVID when we first. <laughs> yeah, it was and, yes, kind of, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, cool. but yeah, thank, thanks again. I, I, um, we'll look forward to to staying in touch and. Sounds great. This, and so we, we, we really appreciate it. Thanks, John. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Th thanks again. All right. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye. Okay.